I'm Lucas Martel. I am the creator of Walkabout Mini Golf, and we are here on the night mode of Taurus Trap. I haven't talked a lot about the process that goes into hard mode and sort of like where that idea came from and everything. So I figured just give you a little tour. This was the original island of the very first course. We actually created it four years ago at this point, and it lived on for a little while as our test and went through a handful of revisions doing a mini golf course. It's like, well, you have to do the classic pirate island, like 80% of the mini golf places that you find in any like beach tourist town are. What's our version of that? And how do we take it and make it a little bit larger than life? I guess just uh, follow me and I'll walk you through. So we arrive on the dock and this was a pretty early course. You, you really do sort of like see the evolution to a couple of the newer courses of just sort of like how much further we've taken it. We are planning at some point to go back and remaster some of these without changing any of them. I still love this one. It's still just a classic. And there's also something that these early courses, it feels like it really kind of let us get some of those, just the classic mini golf holes, the classic designs, like some very, very sort of like pure mini golf that a lot of these original courses started off with. And it's given us a great base to expand on and go a little bit further. It takes so much work to create a course that the idea of building it out and sort of like relighting it and turning it into night mode and also just making the holes more challenging, like it was such an obvious thing to do. And of course, like many things, scope creep. Now, if you look at some of the hard modes on our more current courses, some of them are completely redesigned, but even on, I think original Gothic was the very, very first one that was so drastically different from the easy version that it was even a totally different scene file that didn't share anything with, with the previous version. So yeah, so this has kind of grown and gotten a lot bigger over time, but there's just something that I love about visiting these locations and being able to just change the time of day and change the level of difficulty. And it just adds so much replayability. During the production of, it would have been original Gothic, was when Henikachi first came on board to do the fox hunts. And so we already passed it, but towards the first hole on every hard course, the hard courses don't have the lost balls, but they have an object with a little yellow arrow. And if you pick that one up, it starts a scavenger hunt on your wrist. And Henikachi came in to basically just start doing those fox hunts. And now they've become such a great part of the game. Just that whole scavenger hunt, it really sort of gives us an opportunity to build a fictional lore of what this place is, who created it, why they created it, and just really add a, a whole nother level to all these courses because something about the scale of the courses that we're doing is just perfectly suited for those fox hunt, treasure hunt ideas and really, really encouraging people to take the time to pay attention to their environment and learn about it. Tourist Trap was something that I was playing around with it when it was more of a mobile game using some of the same tech that we had built for a, a game called Laser Mazer. And this course, I had done a gray box version of it. And the actual models were all done by Tad Catalano, who is back with us now. But yeah, this course was one that he had done probably four years ago. And it really was just us testing it out, trying to get it to work. We were also performance testing to see how much performance we could get out of mobile. But one of the big factors of that was that because we got this level working on a mobile device, that is really what made the VR version on Quest possible because we were already having to optimize it so ridiculously heavily in order just for it to run on a phone. You play it, it's sort of this mix AR VR where you actually are holding the phone as if you're sort of looking down at your club and you physically putt. Some people who have been doing some beta testing have even been attaching like their phone to like a selfie stick, which I can't necessarily recommend. But if you're trying to imagine what it's like, imagine putting with a selfie stick while looking through your phone. It works surprisingly well and even lets you play full cross play with VR folks. The fact that we had already started it like that and essentially had it working on a phone was also what allowed me to then sort of when the Quest came out to port the game over to Quest to get it running and to show Oculus at the time. Just be like, hey, we've got, I've got this game running on Quest. And at that point, it was within three months of the Quest 1 launching. So it was a really, really good time. It was a very difficult device to develop for. 
and we just happen to have the right thing at the right time. So many of the developments that we've done since then were all about really embracing the VR and the social factor. But yeah, that wasn't necessarily the thought from the very beginning. So it's evolved a lot in the last few years. All of the easy courses and the night mode hard courses, there were only four. But it's funny, just earlier today, we were talking internally about how we've been able to roll out new features and everything. And I pulled up a photo of the Welcome Island Shack from the very first release version of the game. And it was literally just an empty shack with the four courses listed. And that was it. Us recording this now, we're at 15 courses. All the fox hunts, all of the Welcome Island stuff with the driving range and the putting green, all of that has been added within pretty much the last year here. And one of the other big things that's also changed for us is just that the size of the team has changed quite dramatically. For this initial version of the game, I was mostly doing it solo, although like I said, Tad Catalano, um, who's now back with us, actually did the final models for Taurus Trap here. And now he's back working on quite a few other courses. I'm trying to think if he's even worked on any of the ones that you're seeing. Probably not because the modeling team is generally now working so far ahead that they're working on stuff that's gonna come out a year from now almost. So we've got a lot more things in development and it's definitely changed a good bit that it's no longer just me or even one person. We've now got about 20, we've got a total team size of 25 people and about half of those are focused on the courses and generating new courses, more courses and just amping up the quality. So it's always fun to go back to these original ones and just see where it started and how much it's changed and even how much our processes have changed, which is another reason that I, as much as I love seeing these in, in their original state, I also sort of like, oh man, I'd love to go back and just spruce them up a little bit because we've learned so much in the course of the last couple of years of how to build these things and some of the aspects of just how you construct these that really make a difference. and. It wouldn't change the gameplay at all, but just visually, I think that we've really come a long ways in terms of how we build things. The night mode was also something that I just remember going to real life mini golf courses. And there was always something about going to a mini golf course at night when you've got all of the lighting. And a lot of times it's lit by all these little rope lights and Christmas lights and just like all these little light sources. It just takes a place that can sometimes by the light of day feel a little run down and it just makes it, you know, that bar that if they flip the lights on at 2 a.m. is like, ooh, a little gross. But then when you're there and just there's a ton of people and it's just an active place that, yeah, I think that the night mode was very much something that I realized that that was to me a big part of mini golf it creates a really, really unique um just vibe the difference of it between day and night is well night and day pun completely intended because i believe in intending your puns so in terms of henning coming on and the fox hunts and how you even hire for something like that henning and really a lot of the team has kind of been built up in a much more organic way based off of folks that we've been longtime collaborators with and it's a lot more ad hoc although we've gotten a bit more typical in how we're doing stuff now but for that initial round of folks, Henning was our lead animator on a project called The Ocean Maker, which is an animated short film that we actually made on a little island off the coast of Belize. At the time, he and a couple of the other folks that were working on it were freelancers in the New York animation scene. They hopped around for gig to gig and I was producing a project there that I was in New York for about three months and met so many awesome people and at the same time also realized that none of them had seen the light of day or like literally seen the sun for probably four weeks. Because when you're working in Manhattan and you're starting work at 9 a.m. and you're leaving at six or seven at night, but you literally never see the sun because you're down in this canyon of buildings. And so I had wanted to do this independent short film. I had done one previously called Pigeon Impossible, which was the basis for Spies in Disguise, this movie with Will Smith and Tom Holland that Blue Sky produced. It came out in 2019. I had had some experience doing animation production, and I knew that I wanted to have a small team, but I really wanted to have everybody in the same place working full time on the project, even for a short period of time. So came up with this kind of idea that like, I was just paying for everything out of pocket. I couldn't really fully afford to hire all these really, really awesome pros, but I did have enough 
set aside that could buy plane tickets and rent a couple of houses in this little island off the coast of Belize. So Henning was our lead animator. We went down there and we worked for, there were eight of us for about seven weeks. And we pretty much made the short film in that time we were there. We came back and did some finishing and some more technical polish stuff, but the bulk of the creative stuff was all done there right on the island. That's where Mighty Coconut started. That's where the name Mighty Coconut came from as we wanted something that kind of harkened back to the island. And Mighty Coconut really came from this desire to keep the band together because we all had such a great time working on it and also kind of a life-changing experience just sort of living on this tourist island for seven weeks. In the case of Henning specifically, one of the last things that we did while we were there on the island is that he created a fox hunt for all of us to do. And in one of our days off, we basically spent it tooling around the island, solving all these clues that he had laid out. And some of them were crazy difficult. You had to figure out how to physically go to a place and like line up two of the towers. It was just like some fantastic puzzle games, but it was in real life. And it was one of the coolest things that a lot of us had experienced. And so I realized at some point that we've got these mini golf courses that are this perfect size that you can hide clues. People can get around fairly quickly. It doesn't take them 20 minutes to traverse from one side of the map to the other. And it's a place that people know and have spent a decent bit of time because by this point, they've already played the day mode. Now they've probably played the night mode and maybe they've even played it a couple times. So they're really getting to know the space very well. And when you say the pirate ship, you know exactly what they're talking about. I know one of the clues is like, oh, the fallen mast of the pirate ship. Well, if you go to the pirate ship and you look around, you can really sort of like, oh, I see exactly where I should be finding this next clue. In the case of Henning, yeah, bringing him on was really just taking something that he already was doing on his own and just kind of folding it into the process. The thing that I wasn't expecting is that that was also about the time that Walkabout started to blow up. And just in general, it's sort of like VR was getting more popular. There were more people playing. And we realized that, oh, there's an opportunity here to keep doing more courses. I had thought that it was going to be, oh, these four courses, and that was pretty much going to be it. And so Henning wanted to basically take a crack at doing a course. I'm trying to remember what exactly the first one was that he worked on. I believe it was Tethys Station. He came up with the design of that and sketched everything out, came up with the whole designs and pretty much built the gray box version of Tetha Station. And then we also brought on Edward, who actually come on even a little earlier to start doing all of the modeling stuff. He took Henning's gray box design and really started building it out and turning it into a real place. And that was the start of the team and some of the first courses where I really started handing that baton over. And since then, Almost all, but I think Coyote Valley was really the only one that I did a decent bit of the design and the gameplay for, but pretty much everything since that has been Henning. So it's just one of those things that, you know, you're kind of right place, right time, and the right person comes along and, and knows what to do and has that insight to take what you're doing and do it better than you were doing. It's so fantastic to see when you've got a team like this. As for the origin of the hidden balls, so the hidden balls were actually something that was in the original release version of the game. That I think was the precursor to the fox hunts. I knew that I wanted to have something kind of like the fox hunts and that, oh, let's, let's give people a reason to explore the area outside of just the gameplay because all of these spaces are cool. Let's encourage people to actually climb up these stairs as opposed to just hitting the trigger to teleport to your ball. Let's give people a reason to actually walk about the course. And so the lost balls were in the very first version of the game and it did kind of give that, that great secondary activity that I'm consistently surprised at just like how, how the lost balls are almost the bigger draw for a lot of people than the actual mini golf. In retrospect, it, it totally makes sense. There's something that's just very, very fun and rewarding about it. So the Lost Balls were actually in the initial version of the game, and then the Fox Hunt was very much a, how do we take that idea of the Lost Balls and do something similar, but also more advanced and more challenging, and also let us do something different with basically the same thing in hard mode. So this would be hole 16 right here. Early on, with the design of a lot of the hard mode holes, we, or I guess at the time it was I, but now it's sort of very much we. I really wanted to sort of like kind of keep them in a more traditional, like, okay, imagine sort of like, okay, it's lit up at night. A lot of mini golf courses have those two courses. You've got the easy and then you've got the challenge course or whatever they call it. 
I always loved that idea. And even I just playing it realized it's so like, oh man, we've already got so much of the elements here. Sort of like, it doesn't take a whole lot to change the gameplay design around to make something more challenging. In fact, making something challenging is one of the easiest things to do. Making something fun is one of the hardest things to do. So once you've got something that's fun, if you want to add a level of difficulty, there are so many different things that you can do. And one of the big things that we always try to do when we're doing the hard modes is to look at the whole as it exists and think about how can we really change how you play this hole. It's appropriate that we're getting up to hole 18 because something that we've also found is that in general, I believe all of the holes up until now have pretty much been the same footprint. And hole 18 is typically where we like to break things up and do it a little differently. So this was the very first example of a hole that was completely redesigned for the hard mode. In the easy version, you just go down some shoots. And in this one, we started introducing this idea of like, well, you know, it doesn't actually matter if you've got the ball sort of like catapulting downstairs and might fall off. You're in VR, you're not worried about someone getting hit on the head by a flying golf ball. So this was probably one of the first holes that we really started to break away from the stuff that you could do in traditional mini golf. Let's start pushing it. Let's start trying to do some things that wouldn't be possible if you weren't in VR. So this was a great example of that. This is also one of the holes that I love because many of the more experienced players have learned that there is actually a trick shot where if you start at the tee and you putt backwards, you can get onto the final green and even score a hole in one if you are really, really careful with that. So just seeing folks do some of those trick shots really became something that encouraged us to leave those possibilities open, but also to design things with that in mind that there's a lot of different ways. And because we're in this VR space, like anything can be a possible way to play a hole. And it definitely opened things up. And we try to support that possibility of people playing things in very unconventional ways. And it's so fun to see what players come up with as they're trying those trick shots.